The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Talo for lover. I'm Madeline Chapman, editor at The Spin-Off. If you have the means, consider supporting our high-quality journalism by becoming a Spin-Off member. Sign up now at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. You're listening to Business is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business is Boring is brought to you by Spark Lab, offering inspiration and practical advice to help businesses find their edge. To hear more about Spark Lab, including details about the latest events, workshops, and business tools, visit sparklab.co.nz. And now, here's your host, Simon Pound. You're listening to Business Is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business Is Boring is made by The Spin-Off with help from Callahan Innovation. Here's your host, Simon Pound. Once something is done, it becomes expected, even if it was pretty unlikely to begin with. If you were to go back 10 years and say New Zealand would soon be one of the handful of countries in the Space Club, regularly sending satellites to space and famous for its space industry, you'd probably be laughed out of the room. The biggest force behind this quite amazing change is Peter Beck at Rocket Lab. His dream was so unexpected and unlikely that when he told his high school guidance counsellor he wanted to make rockets, they called his parents in for a meeting. He persevered, working at Fisher & Paykel and Callaghan Innovation's forerunner, Industrial Research, where he was supported with parts and after-hours lab access to experiment and refine his rockets. To get Rocket Lab off the ground, he's had to pull together some of the world's biggest investors, have international laws changed, and successfully pioneer innovations in making and sending rockets that are now industry standards. It was wildly unlikely at most every step, but today Rocket Lab is on the verge of a massive listing on the American Stock Exchange and a big shift to larger rockets. To talk the journey, persevering, and New Zealand being a member of the Space Club, I joined Peter Beck out at their Mount Wellington Rocket Lab HQ. Great. Hey, so so thank you for being here. Um, tell me about how you were into rockets really early on, and was that considered something you could kind of do when you were at school? No, I mean, I think the earliest memory I have about you know space in general was uh, standing outside under the night sky with my father and him pointing out that all the stars in the sky were were suns and they had planets around them. And in fact, there could be somebody on that planet standing back and looking at me. And and at that point, it was like, wow, that's that's a big concept to try and you know try and understand. And I think I was certainly under five. And uh, and and that was really really what sparked the you know the imagination of space for me. And then engineering was always something that that uh, was within our family and and something that you know we always did. So. It was really the perfect um, alloy of, of kind of engineering and, and space. And ultimately, if you put those two things together, um, the hardest thing you can do is go and build rockets. So naturally, that's what happened. Wow. And I guess a lot of kids kind of see the night sky and have their heads expanded and see rockets and go, wow, they're cool. But not everyone kind of sticks to it. How did you kind of um, keep keep that dream alive and keep going? Like, um I saw an interesting story about you talking to your school guidance counsellor mm. and saying you wanted to build rockets. What, what happened then and how did you keep going? Well, yeah, I mean, they, they called my parents in because they thought that my aspirations were thoroughly unreasonable and unattainable um, and that I should go and get a job at the local TY aluminium smelter as an engineer. I was, you know, very good with my hands. Um, but for me, that just, just you know, was not an option. Um, you know, it, it was always, uh, always going to, you know, about the rocket and I think the the original plan was actually to go and work for NASA or for one of the big aerospace corporations um, but um, but it ultimately uh, it's a long story but ultimately I ended up starting rocket lab instead so you were you were in South- Southland yes and went to your guidance counselor and said I want to build rockets and they called your parents <laughs> well, well, it, was, it was more big begrudgingly yeah. I had to go along to this careers thing and, and I remember having to sit there kind of looking at the roof going oh this is a waste of time 
uh, and and going through the motions um, of of what I wanted to do. And I was, it was very obvious and clear what I wanted to do, and I had a, a, a plan, you know, mapped out to get there. Um, and uh, and and you know, that I think they just thought that that was that that was just a waste of of other potential options. How did you then get yourself into Fisher and Paykel and then into industrial research from mm. from from that um, from yeah from a place that wasn't kind of encouraging you to follow those dreams? Well, I mean, so the plan was always to go and get a trade in in in, in you know the most complicated thing that I could um, because rockets are complicated to build, um, and uh, so I went and did a, a tool and die making apprenticeship at Fisher and Paykel uh, Appliances in Dunedin. And there I was super lucky um, because all of the, the folks around me, both in the workshop and the design office, uh, you know, I'd run two shifts. So during the day, I'd work for Fisher and Paykel. During the night, I would, uh, I would work for Peter and I'd be building rockets. And I was so lucky that uh, I got free use of the workshop and, and all of their CAD and analysis tools and, and, and way I would go. I mean, they did, they did uh, insist that I left at, at midnight because I used to stay until two or three in the morning. And uh, and and you know, I think the health and safety came in a bit a bit hard on me on that one. So so I had to stop the second shift at midnight, um, and I remember that was that, that that was a great to do. But um, but other than that, you know, I had just complete support. And you know, I would I would arrive at my desk in some mornings, and there would be lumps of titanium just labelled apprentice training projects, and I knew that everyone knew they were for for you know for, for building rocket engines. That's so cool to have that support around you there. What led you to industrial research, which is kind of the forerunner of Callahan, isn't it? Yeah, it's the old DSIR. Yeah, so I was working at the time. I was working for a super yacht company, and um, and it always it kind of it, I was project managing um, a, a role there, and it always kind of drove me insane that um, on the super yacht we were making titanium doorknobs uh, for the kitchen to save weight. But yet in the back where the owner sits, we pour many, many tons of sand in the back to try and, you know, deaden the sound. And it's a very simple problem to solve from a, you know, Helmholtz resonator because you've got a very defined frequency that, you know, the propellers and the engines make. So we don't need to just pour sand in there as a much smarter approach. So I started, you know, building some analytic models and, and trying to determine this and ultimately uh, contacted uh, industrial research for some, some, for some assistance on that. Um, and uh, it looked like a really cool place to work, and um, and of course I would have access to the Crown's equipment, um, which would really accelerate my my rocket building activities during the night shift. So um, I applied for a job there, and uh, I was a research engineer there for for many years. And while there, you know, how did you meet, and what what was the kind of um, circumstances around? making relationships with some of these people who would end up being um, real supporters through the rest of the journey into Rocket Lab. Yeah, I think I'd, if I look back through my career, I've just been super lucky with people who who, who wanted to um, support me. And um, industrial research was no different. You know, I would do, do, do the day shift and then the night shift would come around and, and um, you know, I had all of the crown asset to, um, to, to leverage to build more and more complicated uh, systems. And uh, just surrounded by the most incredible scientists and engineers as well to to learn from, and you know those years were were all very very you know formative, um, you know learning how to strain gauge and and uh, learning how to, to you know to do vibration and vibration testing and analysis and on and on it goes, and all those things are you know really really important. We you know when you go and build something like a launch vehicle. Across those years, you kind of famously didn't go to university, although you kind of made your own university in the evenings, it, it sounds like. Um, what was that decision and and why did you make that? So the plan was, don't get me wrong, the plan was always to go to university. Um, but, uh, you know, the most important thing to start with was, um, you know, to, to, to build the engines and build the, you know, the rocket things that I, I wanted to. So the most important thing to begin with was a trade um, and having the hand skills to, you know, to do these things because there is no courses. You can't go to university and learn about you know rocket combustion dynamics. So you have to kind of learn yourself. And if you're going to learn yourself, that means you need to build them yourself. So uh, that was that was kind of the first step. And then you know the plan was always to go to university. Um, it's just I've I've never quite got there yet. Um, and it, it almost became um, you know slightly pointless because I remember when I was at IRL, I was supervising final year design students. 
But if I wanted to get my degree, I would have to go to university and take a first year design course. So it didn't really make a whole lot of you know sense of good use of time. So um, you know, I just um, I just kept on moving forward. And how did you go about setting up the company in the first place? As it's such a cool kind of you know once things have been done, it's like you know people are now saying, oh well, New Zealand has a great uh, mm. space exploration industry. <laughs> There wasn't when you were setting up. Like, no. how did you go about convincing those first people to get behind you with this really audacious goal? So it actually was a trip to the United States. So, you know, as I said in the beginning, my plan was always to kind of work for NASA or one of the large uh, space companies. So I went to the, uh, you know, this was when I was at IRL. I went to the United States on a bit of a rocket pilgrimage and, and went and spoke and saw to all the people I've been corresponding with over the years. And from that trip, there was really two fundamental learnings. Um, So part of the trip was to go into um, the Mojave Desert, and there's a a bunch of um, small companies in there doing really innovative things. Uh, So I went and visited all those guys, and the first thing that I learned that all these companies that have been funded by the US government and doing cool stuff and all the rest of it that I'd kind of looked up to over the years uh, were absolutely fundamentally no different to what I was doing in my garage at home. And that sounds kind of a bit of a crazy thing to say, but actually they had the same combustion and stability issues with their hybrid rocket motors as I did. They were using the same national instruments equipment as I was. And there, w- there was actually, there wasn't this massive gulf that I kind of had perceived in, in my mind. And then the second fundamental, you know, as I went round NASA and I went round all the, the large space companies and, and was kind of proclaiming that uh, satellites were going to shrink and there needed to be a small launch vehicle to launch them, um, nobody kind of disagreed with me, but... Um, but actually, uh, you know, everybody said, well, we'll wait until the government tells us to do that and fund us to do that. Um, then that will be a real thing. So um, it, was, it was kind of a crazy time because, uh, I'd, you know, for many, many years I'd, I'd built this picture in my head about what the, the US space industry looked like and then and my place in it. And then found that that had been completely turned on its head. Um, you know, all the important things that I felt should be being done weren't being done. And... You know all the all of the kind of uh, you know companies and, and projects that I thought were just you know way above what I was doing turned out to be kind of the same. Um, so there's nothing like a 12-hour flight back from from LA to kind of reconcile your life. And by the time I'd landed, I decided, well, you know what, I'm just going to do this myself. I'm going to do the things that I feel are important, and um, and uh, you know quit my job and start a rocket lab, and that was that. And that insight that the satellites were getting smaller and so launch vehicles could be smaller. That allowed you to get going kind of an order of magnitude cheaper and leaner and, um, you you know, less, um, you you know, you could have smaller launch sites and smaller rockets and all all the rest of it. Hmm. How did, how was that um, received by conventional wisdom when you went out to raise money? Uh, Well, within Silicon Valley, um, it was received very well. I mean, Let's be real here. I mean, I was the only one running around Silicon Valley trying to build a rocket. I mean, these days it's pretty common. There's, there's, I think there's about 140 companies trying to do what we've done. Um, but at those times, you know, I was definitely the odd one out. Uh, you know, this crazy Kiwi guy running around, you know, trying to build rockets. Um, and it was basically Elon and, and myself trying to do that. So, um, so it was, it was, it was definitely unusual. But. Um, a lot of the um, venture capitalists that I spoke to actually had invested in satellite companies, small satellite companies, and they were all sitting on the ground trying to get a ride into orbit. So when I came along, it did, really didn't take much selling because it's like, yeah, we know the pain. We've got all these satellites and all this investment stuck on the ground, so actually a rocket would be super handy. And over the years, as you've you know gone to the valley and talked to those, you know, Big name VC that you've um, you, you, you've brought on board. What does it mean to have um, you know some of those names on the cap table, uh, especially things like Lockheed Martin, who are you know so um, so involved and so synonymous with the industry? Yeah, so I mean, I've always uh, looked at building a company very similar, you know, to playing a game of chess, and it's all about moving the right pieces in the right place, and um, bringing on the right investor is critically important. And you know, as I help New Zealand companies today, um, that's that's one of the key things that that we always try and do is is bring you know really high quality investors around the cap table. Um, my view is that you know, if if you if you have a, a bunch of really bad engineers, then you end up with a bad product. If you have a bunch of really bad investors, you end up with a bad company. 
So bringing the right investors in and being really, really fussy about it and being really fussy about the cap table is super, super important. So for us, um, you know, uh, we, we're only interested in bringing on tier one uh, Silicon Valley VCs. So th- these are the guys that, you know, look for really big opportunities and things that have to have a meaningful impact to the world. So if you can bring on one tier one VC, then chances are you can bring on more tier one VCs uh, along your journey. But it's a little bit harder if you start at the, you know, the bottom end of the pile to kind of work your way up. Um, so, you know, bringing in the right investor from day one is just super critical. And to get the actual permission to do these things, like looking at your journey, the things you've had to do, you're not just kind of doing the old cliche of, um, you, you know, uh, putting the tracks down in front of the locomotion. You're actually, you've actually had to go out and get international treaties renegotiated. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. You know, t- tell us about like, um, tell us about that. What what it took to actually get from uh, not being able to send rockets out of New Zealand mm. to sending rockets out of New Zealand. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I spent a third of my life as a diplomat, actually. Um, so, uh, y- yeah, um, it turns out you can't just turn up into a country and start launching rockets because, <laughs> um, you know, governments look at rockets as weapons of mass destruction because the reality is if you can put a satellite into orbit, you can put, you know, a warhead on any country in the planet. So not surprisingly, uh, you know, countries have all this uh, non-proliferation and non-weapons of mass destruction treaties. So in order for us to build or to build and launch out of New Zealand, we had to uh, convince um, basically America to change their 40-year policy of denial, meaning for the last 40 years, any country that wanted to create a space launch capability, um, America would, uh, would say no. And the reason why that's important is under the MTCR treaty, if one of the 36 signatories says no, all other 36 also have to say no. It's, you know, it's kind of a global a non-proliferation uh, treaty. So uh, that that was that was pretty difficult, um, and uh, we were super lucky to once again, you know, we had the support of of the U.S. government, we had the support of the New Zealand government. I spent a very long time in a Holiday Inn across the road from the the U.S. State Department in Washington D.C., and uh, it took uh, took a while, but we we're able to hammer out a bilateral treaty between uh, New Zealand and and the U.S. Uh, to enable us to to launch rockets down here in New Zealand, which. Um, yeah, and then once that, that bilateral treaty was signed, then New Zealand had a whole lot of obligation under that treaty. So there had to be uh, the High Altitude and Space Activities Bill, um, you know, went through Parliament Select Committee and passed into law. Then somebody needed to administer the law. So the space agency was created. Then the Aussies got jealous and they created their own space agency too. It's a true story. If you look at the timing, you can see. <laughs> um, and uh, and so on and so forth. And then there was a whole lot of um, kind of other regulation that, that kind of needed to be changed. Um, for example, we had to get uh, space designated as a freight destination. Otherwise, when a customer came in with a you know $50 million satellite, they'd have to pay GST. But because space is a freight destination, it's a temporary import-export. Um, and all of, these, all of these kind of craziness that, that needed to occur. Yeah, which do seem, those kind of settings, uh, they seem like they could be afterthoughts, but none of it, none of the other innovations can work if you aren't able to uh, launch things off. Exactly. And, and tell me about some of those other innovations. Like um, a number of things that you, you pioneered have now become the standard, mm. but were very much not conventional wisdom. And I just, I just love like to, you know, once things are done, they're obvious. But, yeah. but you know, like it wasn't at all. Tell me about things like the the 3D printing mm. and, um, yeah, like 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 the the yeah different different engine approaches. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when when we first started, um, you know, we we were we we're focusing on the end goal. So um, we're not afraid to take on re- big, really difficult R and D projects and. One of the one of if you look at one of the constraints on the cost of building a rocket engine, um, it's it's actually the manufacturing process. So we started three D printing rocket engines when you know metal three D printers were being used for like I think their claim to fame at the time was like a cat's prosthetic. That was what you know three D printers were going to do. Um, and you go to a trade show and the, you know you, you pick up a bottle top, you know you know bottle opener and bits and pieces, and we're like, well, we're going to take this technology and we're going to three D print the most thermally stressed and structurally stressed component there is on the planet being a rocket engine chamber. And at that point, um, you know, I think people people like, well, that's that's a very difficult thing to do. And, and um, you know, we announced the engine at the National Space Symposium um, in, in Colorado Springs. It's the largest, you know, space conference in the world. And uh, I know it was, it, you know, we had some, some, some people thinking it was a great idea and I would say a lot of people thinking it was a really bad idea um, and very, very ambitious. 
Um, but, you know, as you point out now, I mean, it is the industry standard. Um, everybody 3D prints their rocket engine. In fact, there's a whole company now that that's created um, that, that just 3D prints engines and parts of rockets. Um, so um, so very, very much, you know, standard within the industry now. And that other unconventional approach, uh, the smaller payloads and mm. the smaller rockets, has that also become, um, you, you know, how, how's that changed in the industry since you launched? Well, when we when we started, there was really only one other company, um, uh, a company by Richard Branson called Virgin Orbit, um, and um, uh, they were there was really Virgin Orbit and us um, that were that was progressing down the road to um, you know to provide this service. Um, you know, Virgin Orbit uh, had I think they've spent like a billion dollars and they've had one flight. Um, so uh, kind of it gives you a bit of a sense for how difficult this actually is. Um, you know, out of all of the history of space flight, there's only been, you know, SpaceX and Rocket Lab that have delivered, you know, regular reliable access to space from a commercial perspective. So, you know, it's, it's, it's insanely difficult. In fact, I wish it wasn't so difficult. Um, but, uh, but, you know, now, like I said, I think there's about 140 companies trying to, trying to get there, but... You know, we remain still the only one that is in small launch that's providing a regular service. How important was it to be doing it from New Zealand? Because I imagine, you know, if it hadn't worked out with all of the uh, government <laughs> negotiations, you could have, you, you know, fallen back on doing stuff out of the States or something. But what does that ability to be launching from here uh, bring you? Yeah, so I think the, the, the easy thing to do would have just been um, to, to move everything to the US and just launch out of the US. That would have been by far the easiest thing to do. But the challenge with that is that in the US there is a certain cap on launch frequency. And that's primarily because um, there's a lot of air traffic in the United States and you have to close down air traffic every time you fly a launch vehicle, air traffic around it. So um, so we, you have to take the long view here. And, and the short view would have been, yeah, we should have just gone to the US and uh, launched a few rockets and that'll be that. But you quickly, you know, bump up against a scale issue. So the whole reason why we have, you know, so much down here in New Zealand is, is because of the launch site down in the Mahia Peninsula. Uh, that is the only private orbital launch site in the entire world. And that launch site is licensed to launch uh, every 72 hours for the next 20 years. So if you put that into context, that launch site has more launch availability than all of the launch sites in the continental United States times two. Um, and if you're really serious about accessing space in a big way, then that's actually fundamentally what you need. You can have all the rockets in the world, but if you can't actually launch them, it's all pointless. How many people did you go and knock on the door of and say, I've got the stream that New Zealand's going to join the space club, which is a pretty exclusive club, and we're going to be launching off this little sliver of land on the east coast of uh, of New Zealand. And um, you know, how many people just kind of said, oh, well, that's that's just too far-fetched or that's too fanciful uh, along the way? Well, I think, I think the secret here is to not write it all down in one dissertation, because if you do, I think you would you would believe it to be so fanciful that it wouldn't be possible. I mean, if you think of all the things that needed to align, just not from a technology perspective, I mean, firstly, we had to build a rocket that worked. Um, and there's only been one other company in history have done that, commercial, you know, private company that had done that. So that that's that's challenging. And then, you you know, you've got all of the bilateral treaties, and that never happened before, and you've got to build a whole launch site, and then we had to put tracking stations all around the world, we had to upgrade the internet back off of Gisborne, and we had to build 30 kilometres of road, and that's just the infrastructure part of it. Um, and then, you know, so on and so forth. So I think I would be scared to just write, sometimes it's better to just write this down, otherwise you never start. Um, it's just better to, you know, pick the end goal and just start running. And tell me about that decision to then go to um, the larger class of rockets, the mm. neutron class of, of rockets, and kind of, um, you know, <laughs> uh, famously eating your, your hat. Uh, talk, talk me through that. Well, at Rocket Lab, you know, we have a saying, we do what we say we're going to do. So I always said that I would eat my hat, so I eat my hat. Um, and that's just the way it is here. Um, but no, uh, so, you know, the, the neutron vehicle is, yeah, it's a very big rocket. Um, and uh, it, it's designed... Uh, you know, to, to lift large numbers of either mega constellations or um, cargo or crew to the International Space Station or, or beyond. So, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, the, 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 the Electron vehicle, very successful small launch vehicle and will remain uh, so, and, and that serves a really, really nice niche. Uh, but the Neutron is really focused at, um, you know, the, the, the next kind of great niche, which is human spaceflight, 
um, and also uh, you know large numbers of spacecraft. Tell me about some of your inspiration for uh, the way you've approached that from the Soviet uh, Soyuz uh, scheme of rockets. Well, I mean, um, everything we do here is very analytical. So we looked back through history and we said, well, what is the most successful launch vehicle in history? And it's the the Soyuz, the Soviet Soyuz launch vehicle. Um, and then we also looked forward at, you know, what is the, um, you know, what what is the the size of payload that are likely to be, you know, launched here in the next decade or so. And um, if you look backwards, it's about five tons. If you look forwards, it's about five tons. So you need about eight tons to lift humans. So um, that's why we settled on around about eight tons uh, to orbit, because historically it's been the most successful size launch vehicle. Um, and in the future, that's that's you know the class of payload that it needs to lift. Um, and you just may as well make it a little, lift a little bit more to carry some humans. And what will that enable? Like, what do you see? You know, if you were to write down where, where you mm. see the world being and. 15 years or 20 years or 50 years as a result of this increased capability to um, to lift and, 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 and go, uh, you know, to the moon or whatever. Like, what, yep. what does it look like in 20 years in the best case scenario? Well, I, th- I think the world looks vastly different than it does today. I mean, I think that where we are with space right now is right at the beginning. It's kind of like, you know, if you want to compare it to the internet, it's kind of like, you know, we've, we've, we've sent our first email over the internet but we don't really understand the potential of you know of of the internet. You know, who who would have thought that we can barely live our lives now? Um, you know, uh, it, it, re- really. So space is exactly in the same place. It's 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 only been a few years since commercial companies were able to access it at a reasonable price on a reasonable time frame. Uh, so it's kind of like you, you imagine it's the first ship that's that has sailed across the seas, and all of the commerce and and things that are going to come out of actually being able to access space as, as a as a domain. So um, you know, I think I think the world is going to look very very different here. Um, we're already seeing uh, you know a huge amount of developments, but with that also comes um, the the kind of uh, the response being being responsible um, you know for that environment as well. Um, and I, th- I guess that's one of the things that, as as a company, we're we're very pro space, obviously, and we're pro access space, we're pro use space, but we also uh, are very pro um, responsible use of space, and and we um, we, we certainly talk at at uh, uh, we're definitely the louder voice within the industry about hey, this these you know mega constellations are great, but how are we going to do this sustainably? And even with the electron launch vehicle. Um, you know, the way we go to orbit is quite different to everybody else um, so that we don't leave any junk behind in orbit. So I think there's a great excitement, but we also temper that with, well, hang on, we, we just need to make sure that we use this environment carefully. Can you tell me a little bit about Venus? I saw mm. some when I was looking into uh, the Soyuz uh, rocket program and some of their work. I saw that the remarkable footage mm. that was uh, taken on the surface of Venus by the Soviet program, and the kind of um, the sound that they captured yes, as yes. well, uh, and it just made me think that it's so small in our imagination of space mm. compared to Mars or mm-hmm. the Moon or yes. you know the rings of Saturn or whatever. Um, but it was eerie and wonderful. Yeah, no, a, a Venus is a much uh, much forgotten planet. And in fact, if you look at Venus and Earth, they're, they're far more similar than Venus, other than Earth and Mars. Um, now, I think, uh, you know, Venus is, is really Earth's sister gone full climate change on us. Um, and there's a tremendous amount we can learn from Venus. So I, I've always been uh, extremely excited uh, about Venus as a destination, and hence we have our own private mission there in 2023. Um, but uh, not not just for what we can learn. But if you look at the places around our solar system, uh, there's a few places that um, it's kind of hypothesised that there could be life. Yeah. Wow. And so you're heading there in 2023. 2023. Yeah. Yeah. So um, and and it really comes back right back to the standing with my father out there one night uh, as a very young child, and him him really saying, "Hey, look, there could be other life on on these planets." And in, if, if we want to take a true scientific approach here, um, there is no evidence to support life outside Earth today. Uh, now, that would change you know, our view on the universe significantly. If we can find life in the clouds of Venus, then it's pretty, pretty reasonable to assume that life is prolific through the universe, um, which is a different, you know, it's an evidence-based fact rather than, um, you know, hoping that there's other life out there. I think if, if that question could be answered in my lifetime, that would be a wonderful thing. You had a pretty big week when you were announcing 
the neutron rockets that would allow yep. that, and also the listing uh, on the US stock exchange. Mm. What what does that extra capital from that listing uh, open up for you to do? And yeah, why go down that route? As um, mm. as I guess there had been great success in your company from dealing with people with very long term perspectives, yep. like you've attracted great VC and also a sovereign fund of Australia yep. and yep. the like uh, c- coming on board. Um, yeah, why why go to the market? Well, it, it's, it's for two reasons. Um, so, so firstly, um, you know, we're looking to grow a very large company here, and um, we, we've had, as you point out, we've had no, we've had great success in in raising uh, private uh, private equity, and that that that's a that's a fine way to do it. Um, but as we look to to kind of grow and expand, and I mean, we've talked a lot today about our, our launch vehicle side, um, but we have a space systems division that is is growing at an equally fast rate. Um, and really going to the public markets, markets enable us to do two, two things. One, yep, access to capital, that's great. But you could argue that there's plenty of access to capital through the private markets anyway, so that's not the needle mover here. What the needle mover here is, is actually the having a public currency to go and do the things like acquisitions that we that we really want to do. Um, we, you know, we, there, was a, there was a deal we tried to do last year. It was a very big deal. It would have been great. Um, but you know, our price wasn't any different to the ultimate purchaser of that company, except they had a public currency. Um, so when you're a private company without that public currency, it's very difficult to do really big deals. So um, that that was one of the fundamental reasons uh, to go public, and this was was already you know well baked into our trajectory from 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 early on. Um, and uh, I think it's it's kind of cool as well as I mean to have a you know high quality space asset that um, that the public can participate in because whether whether you kind of um, you know like it or not, uh, space is something that very, very much attracts uh, public interest and, and, and a public following. Um, everybody, everybody kind of gets excited, um, and being able to share in that, uh, in, in that, in, in within a, within a, a new space company, we thought was a great thing to do. Yeah, and there is that mystique. Hey, um, are there? There must be pinch me moments on the way for you working with, you know, just the just the idea of that. You know, it's so it's so cool. What's it like to you know go from being. Um, yeah, make, making small rockets in your garage and mm. working after hours and kind of gradually increasing the the, the scale and um and kind of um yeah uh, the yeah the coolness of it all to then <laughs> to then having kind of NASA as a customer. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to say that it you know you can sit sit back with a glass of wine on a beach somewhere and kind of. Think about that, but honestly, I don't. Um, I'm just f- internally frustrated that it's taking to so long. Um, I would have, you know, I would have hoped that we were further down the road than 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 where we are. Um, and look, we've made we've made great progress, and and um, but but everything always takes too long. Um, and that's just I think that's within this industry, everything's very very difficult. Um, but I mean, as I look forward, I think um, some of the some of the the best the best moments have been, um, you know, certainly flying NASA as a customer. That that was that was great, and then you know we've got some really exciting missions to uh, to the moon later this year, and and you know to Mars, and and you know there's some some super exciting things, but um, you know they're always wrapped in, in in a lot of work and a lot of stress, so it's you know it's probably less less easy to kind of certainly you're not just sort of sitting on the sidelines and watching this amazing stuff happen. Everybody here is 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 really works hard to to, to make these things happen. Yeah, and how important is the fact that you're making it happen from New Zealand and in New Zealand, like we're sitting today inside the, you know, quite remarkable HQ in Mount Wellington, uh, and that in and of itself is, you, you know, not not that likely a place for the centre of excellence. And um, yeah, yeah, how, what what is the role of kind of New Zealand and the importance of having it here for for talent in the industry? Yeah, so I mean. Um it should be said that uh, New Zealand is a centre of gravity uh, for engineering, for sure. I mean, uh, we have a, a US facility, a, a Canadian facility, and you know, a US launch pad as well. So we, we kind of spread out with, between in the US and New Zealand. Um, the majority of the, the staff are employed down here in New Zealand. I think um, the, the New Zealand element has is, is, is been really critical. Um, if I think if we'd built if we'd built the business and built the designed the vehicle up in the US. It would look like every other rocket. It would be an aluminium metallic. Um, you know, it would look it would look just like everything else. Um, building it down here in New Zealand, we kind of 
we didn't know what was possible and what wasn't possible. Um, and, um, and, you know, we ended up with a very, very different product that's been very successful. And, you know, we see a lot of people trying to emulate that. Um, and I think, um, you know, there, there is a kind of New Zealand, New Zealand spirit here as well um, that, uh, that, that really enables you to, to, to move quickly and, and achieve great things. The, the flip side to that, of course, is that um, in, you know, in, in New Zealand, we, we do have like a tall poppy syndrome. So um, once, it, once there's certain, a certain level of success, then, um, then it kind of inverts itself a little bit. Kiwis love an underdog, that's for sure. Um, but in, in general, I would say, uh, you know, the success of the company is, 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 is kind of rooted in the fact that we decided that uh, we were going to do the majority of kind of the, the initial development here. Have there been some real hinge moments? Like, um, you, you, you know, there's some very famous examples and the, the SpaceX is very chronicled, really, mm. and the kind of things are going to run out of money and if this yep. explodes again, we're, we're over. There seems to be, from as an outside kind of, you know, observer, a calmer <laughs> <laughs> kind, of, um, uh, kind, kind of trajectory so far. Um, but have there been moments where it, it was on the line and you wondered if it was not going to work? Oh, many, many times, many times. No, I think I think if you if you take a took took a journey in, in into in, into my mind at least it would be a very very scary place. Uh, there has been a um, there's been a number of instances uh, where you know we were right on the edge and you know with with a rocket company um, you know y- y- you pour everything into a launch vehicle and if it if it goes real bad then that's the end of the company. Um, and I think the reason why there's been so few successful rocket companies is the way I kind of liken it and describe it. Um, it's like running through a maze at night, and at every dead end, there's somebody there with a shotgun ready to shoot you. And you you have to run fast because you know you you run out of time, but you also have to peek around the corner and make sure you don't go down the, the dead end because in this industry, if you make one wrong decision, like one wrong engine selection, one wrong trajectory selection, or one wrong anything decision. Um, you, you exhaust so much capital and time that you just you just peter out. So it is incredibly unforgiving, and it's very unforgiving in physics. It's very unforgiving in, in, in engineering. Um, so it's it's just just really really hard to, to do. I remember seeing at uh, a high tech awards, you were given an award, and you video linked in or, or had a, a video played mm. because you couldn't be there that evening because you wanted to be in an event for one of your children. Mm. And you said in the video, uh, look, you know, I'd love to be there, but um, I miss a lot of things with my kids because yep. of this company and I didn't want to miss this. So, yep. um, you know, good on you all and thanks for, <laughs> thanks for the award. <laughs> and I just thought that was so cool, you know. Um, t- tell me about that kind of um, balancing and, yeah, what are the things that you're telling your kids as you look up to the sky? Oh gosh, I would not hold myself up as as kind of uh, a, a representative of work life balance. Um, I'm tremendously lucky to have a really supportive wife and family, and and um, you know, I, as I, I've missed birthday parties and you know everything you can imagine. So uh, you know, but wherever possible you know, these days, I, I try and try and make it up. Um, but you know, I'd say work work life balance is not a strong point of mine at all. So um, tremendous amount of sacrifices by myself, but not just myself, everybody around me, um, you know, uh, my family and, and, uh, and, and also uh, if you think about all of the engineers and, and, and uh, employees at Rocket Lab, nobody comes here to do a day's work where it's just same pl- you know, plain sailing and easy. This is everybody, everybody, you know, really works hard. What would your advice be for someone who, who does have a big dream and the system uh, the system rings up their parents and says, <laughs> "Dream small." <laughs> well, I'd, I'd, I'd tell them to to just not listen. I mean, uh, it's it's funny because I, I spend a lot of time with New Zealand entrepreneurs, and um, the one thing that I've noticed is I'll go to an, like an entrepreneurial event in New Zealand, and you know the the New Zealand entrepreneurs will be, "I can't wait to to make my company worth a million dollars or ten million dollars," and then I'll go to the, exactly the same event. Uh, in, in in Silicon Valley, and the same kind of entrepreneur will be going. I can't can't wait, you know, until my company is worth a billion dollars. It's just an order of magnitude of sense of scale, and it's it's not about the money. It's never never about the money. I mean, it's that that is a measure of you know the success of a company. That's that's it. Um, and you know, the one thing that I always say to New Zealand entrepreneurs is is think of the biggest problem you want to go and solve, and go and solve it. 
Because the reality is that it doesn't matter if you're building a little business or a big business, the pain is the same. Like if we had, if we had decided to do half the half the things that we had done, it still would have been just as painful as doing all the really really big stuff. So um, you know this is this is the one area where I think uh, culturally New Zealanders uh, you know let themselves down is is they don't dream big enough and go after the really really big opportunities. And as a last thought, what will success be for you personally, and what will success be for Rocket Lab? Oh, I have to keep redefining success. Um, it's 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 kind of just a, a stepping journey. Um, and there's the certain things that that uh, personally I, I want to achieve. Um, and one of those is you know uh, was was you know to build a, a successful publicly traded uh, space company and um, also providing really great access to space uh, and and doing really interesting things that ultimately um, you know impact positively us down on earth. I think the the ultimate, you know, if I'm lying on my deathbed, I think the ultimate, you know, metric of the success of both the company and me personally will be, you know, how many how many people did we influence positively in in this whole Rocket Lab journey, and that's you know also one of the key you know key elements for you know for going public is that we're trying to build an enduring, lasting company. Um, the challenge with staying private is, is you know, ultimately I have a, a, a lifespan on this planet, and when that gets extinguished, uh, if if I'm if if it's just me as the company, then you know what happens to the company. So what we're trying to do is is build you know a, a long term enduring enduring company that um, is built on kind of the foundations of. Uh, you saw it no doubt when you walked into the door here. Is you know the first thing you read when you arrive at Rocket Lab is we go to space to improve life on Earth. That's the whole point. Um, so building something that's enduring, uh, building something that delivers on that as a goal, I think will be the definition of success. So cool. Well, thank you so much for sharing the story today, that CEO and founder of Rocket Lab, Peter Beck. Kia ora. My pleasure. Thank you. And thank you to Peter Beck and the team at Rocket Lab for having me for this interview, to Te Aihe Butler for producing and putting it together, and to Callahan Innovation for the ongoing opportunities to tell these stories And thank you for having us along and listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast, head along to the iTunes page and maybe give it a like or a subscribe. It all really helps other people find it. Kia ora. You've been listening to Business is Boring, presented by Simon Pound. Brought to you by The Spinoff and Callahan Innovation. From the Spin-Off Podcast Network, that was Business is Boring, brought to you by Spark Lab. Make sure you're following Business is Boring wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information on Spark Lab, visit sparklab.co.nz. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, Jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. The Spinoff Podcast Network.